Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this Big Tent uh, Zoom uh, festival. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today with uh, Rory Sutherland, the iconic advertising executive. My name's uh, Liam Halligan. I'm an economist, and I know Rory's going to have some tough thing to say about us uh, dismal science scientists, so I'll, I'll strap myself in and, and take it in good stead. Rory Sutherland is, of course, the vice chairman of Ogilvy here in the UK. It's the iconic advertising agency, which he joined in the late 1980s, having studied classics at Cambridge, the late 80s, the last years of what have been called the glory era of advertising. It was a period of excess, Rory has said, although I didn't earn enough to be excessive at the time. Um, Rory is, by any measure, one of the most influential advertising professionals professionals in the world. Uh, he's found fame as a journalist, particularly with his uh, extremely pithy uh, and well thought out uh, and brilliant to read articles in The Spectator, the Wikiman column, which he's been writing for many years. After joining Ogilvy's creative department, he became head of copy and he, he then famously set up the behavioral practice within the agency, doing a lot in my view uh, to help invent the fused discipline of what's now become called behavioral economics, combining economics uh, with insights uh, from the harder science of, of psychology. Uh, a few housekeeping notes. This session is being recorded and will be available to view in the members section of the Big Tent website. It may be used for promotion. Uh, if you'd like to watch a replay of tonight's event or any other Big Tent digital, digital session, um, then that's one of the exclusive benefits available to Big Tent friends and student friends. Visit the Big Tent website for details. I'd like to say to Susie Curran and her team uh, and to George Freeman, the MP who was, uh, uh, Big, Big Tent was really his brainchild. I've been delighted over the years to be associated with this initiative. I think I spoke in the first ever Big Tent session sitting on a hay bale in a tent somewhere in a field. Well, the, the tents these days are much bigger uh, and I'm sure uh, with events like this, um, uh, Big Tent will continue on to bigger and better things. But without further ado, here is Rory Sutherland. Rory, it's great to see you. We usually meet, don't we, in, in Kilkenny for the Kilkenomics uh, Festival that combines economics uh, uh -huh. and comedy. I've seen you there speak there many times. Uh, I know you're going to give us a fascinating uh, half an hour or so opening. The, the first question I'd like to ask you is how can behavioral economics and how can, how can the insights that you have gleaned as an advertising executive help us uh, during the lockdown and in rebuilding the post-corona uh, UK economy? Right, I suppose one of the fascinating things with working in advertising is it's in some ways it's a slightly frivolous and peripheral uh, area of business activity. But there's one extraordinary strength which I think it does inculcate in you if you work there, which is unusually, and I think very unusually for a sort of business or institutional setting, it actively encourages you to think about the same thing in multiple ways. Yeah. What tends to happen within a business culture is that a vocabulary is devised, a model is devised, everybody looks at everything through the lens of this particular model and doesn't really look for explanation anywhere else. And so the problem I have, I think, with policy making is that it disproportionately, in the words of Richard Thaler, who's the Nobel Prize winning behavioral economist, um, Washington, D.C. is run by lawyers who occasionally seek advice from economists. Anybody else interested in helping the lawyers out need not apply. And so economics is a perfectly worthwhile lens from through which to view the world. I'm not disputing that. Uh, you know, and moreover, when I have a dig at economists, the problem I think is caused by people who uh, essentially, um, you know, if I have the odd dig at economists, I'm not really talking about um, uh, the very best economists who are perfectly well aware of the problems uh, that the discipline faces, but people who will essentially assume that an economically rational decision always corresponds to a rational and desirable decision. And who start to use it as a framework for decision making 
without considering other alternatives. I yeah. think that's the, that's the real problem. Yeah. And so I'll just give a little, th it's just a little thought experiment here, but particularly helps if you, if you imagine yourself wearing a suit and in a business meeting, okay? And someone asked the question, why are there far more fish restaurants next to the sea than there are in the middle of inland cities? And of course, what you'll do if you're in a suit in a business meeting is you'll immediately leap to using economics as the explanatory tool okay and you'll say well obviously you know blah 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 logistics blah 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 distribution costs supply chain regular source of fresh fish low prices blah 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 okay now that makes you look perfectly serious and intelligent if you're sitting with a bunch of people from McKinsey but is it really the right answer um, now no one asked that question because once you've come up with an economic explanation for something that is deemed to be the complete and full explanation I would argue one if that were really true you'd expect to see lots of fish restaurants inland um, you know five miles inland from the sea you don't five miles inland from the sea people are selling beef and chicken just they do everywhere else okay you can probably buy high quality fish at extraordinary low prices by going to a London fish market rather than relying on local supply I think there's a possible completely different reason, which is that um, fish tastes better when you're by the sea. <laughs> Simple as that. Psychological explanation, if you're sitting overlooking a beach, a meal of fish will be more enjoyable than if you're sitting overlooking, you know, a crowded street in London. And um, in justification for this, by the way, I'm not being entirely fanciful. There is evidence from psychophysics that rosé wine tastes markedly better if you're next to the sea. I think it tastes shit and when under you're all wearing circumstances. A straw hat. Yeah, when you're wearing a straw hat, that further improves it. <laughs> but one of the assumptions, of course, of economics is that um, human perception is entirely objective, not affected by context. Mm. And so economics starts off before it makes any other errors with a really dodgy epistemology. It assumes we have this kind of unit of utility, the util, in our brains. And we know exactly how much we're prepared to pay for a util. We know how many utils we'll derive from a particular decision and therefore what it's worth paying. Yeah. Now, virtually nothing in my experience of business supports such a naive view of how we perceive things. In fact, you can make an expensive thing seem cheap by simply changing the contextual framework. Okay. Um, an example from marketing, uh, Maserati and Rolls-Royce stopped uh, exhibiting their cars at car shows so energetically and started exhibiting them at yacht and aircraft shows. Right. Now, the simple genius there is if you've been looking at Fairline yachts and um, Learjets all afternoon, a 350,000 euro car becomes practically an impulse buy. Okay. Jump change. <laughs> Jump change. I didn't buy a yacht today, so I'll have a couple of those. It's like going to Ikea for a sofa and coming back with some candles, right? You've got it exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, you don't want to have a wasted journey. Well, while I was here, I might as well pick up one of those cars, you know, <laughs> hang it in davits from my yacht. And, um, the so it starts off with a fundamentally ludicrous view of epistemology everything we know about evolution suggests that evolution has designed our perception of the world to maximize fitness not to maximize accuracy and so uh, if evolution has to make a trade-off between three percent extra fitness at the price of a ten percent sacrifice of accuracy it will make that trade every time there's even a book the case against uh, reality by Don Hoffman, who's an American academic, his claim is that human perception is pretty much, you know, almost consciousness is pretty much akin to the, the, the um, user interface on a computer. In other words, it's designed to be usable, to present information in a way that's usable. It bears almost no relation to the, ra the reality that's going on behind the scenes. And so that's, that, that's economics failing number one, you know, not to consider that perception may have a bearing on uh, response and behavior yeah and i'll give you a lovely example of that extended to policy making which is um nobody one of the things that worries me is if you make a decision that appears economically rational um because economics is considered therefore once you once you you've got something that seems reasonable and rational it's assumed to be the single right answer and therefore no further inquiry is required Okay, so let's take another example. Okay, after my fish restaurant experiment, 5p, uh, a charge for a 5p for a bag, uh, 
had an extraordinary effect on consumer behavior. And the economic explanation of that would be people are so eager to avoid spending 5p on a bag that they immediately go, no, I don't want the bag, please. Well, you know, now yeah. I'm sure the price had an effect. What I would question is whether if you double that to 10p or 15p, the effect will continue. Because a large part of that effect is, I think, driven by changing the choice architecture or the context in which the choice is made. What happened traditionally before you charge for bags is the member of staff put your stuff in a bag by default because it would be rude not to. They handed you the thing in a bag, at which point it would have been extremely rude to refuse. You know, it would have been a very strange social act to go, take back your stinking bag. I just want the three, you know, the three packets of paracetamol and the, you know, uh, <laughs> and, the, and the corn plasters. But that would have been a weird behavior in boots. So the very fact that you charged for it meant that it had to be positioned as an option and therefore the person had to ask. Now, at the point they say, do you want a bag? Any reasonable sane person can look down at the two bags they're already carrying and go, no, just put it in here with yeah. the receipt. And so a lot of things I think are disproportionately explained um, by a recourse to economics. The problem I have is, A, that's not the complete explanation, and it's only by understanding the real deeper why that we can codify knowledge and learning in a way that you can reapply it elsewhere. Um, that's point number one. Secondly, I would argue, and this is the most extreme point, I'm going to be absolutely candid with you here, okay? I'm going to be a bit confessional. I think behavioral science is a science, is a bit crap. OK, yeah. it's, you know, th there's a lot of pee hacking going on. There's a lot of extremely dubious um, uh, research which doesn't replicate. I think it's a bit of a mess. But there's one thing it does do, which I think is of enduring value, which is as a field of inquiry, once you open up the possibility for psychological solutions rather than instrumental or economic ones, it massively increases the possible solution set for any problem. Yeah. And the second thing it does is it rings warning bells um, for certain policy decisions, which no economist would spot. So just to give another example um, of a policy intervention, I have a major rant about the fact that they increased the ISA allowance or whatever it's called now from £3,000 a year to 20. OK, now. Let's park That's the amount people can save tax free. To save annually tax free yeah. by putting this wrapper around it. Yeah. Per person, by the way. So for a married couple, that's 40 grand. Wow. And if you have a kiddie ISA, apparently, not giving the little kids pastors think I'm going to do that. They can forget it. But I mean, uh, you know, I've spent enough on them already. Tough but love, you can Rory, also, tough you, love. <laughs> you can also have a kiddie ISA, which I think allows you to add, add an extra amount on top. Now, I'm sure that's absolutely fantastic for the tiny percentage of the population who are so flaming loaded that they can save 40 grand a year out of um, after-tax income. Yeah. I don't think those people are really in need of significant government help or incentives to save. In fact, they probably have enough trouble as it is spending the money they've got. Okay. Now, there's a secondary problem which the economists didn't spot, which is when it was £3,000 a year, you created the fear of missing out. Yeah. Which is if I can save two grand or two and a half grand or even just, you know, a grand a year. Well, if I don't put it in this year, I'm going to miss the opportunity next year. So let's put in what I can towards this target of three thousand pounds. The second you make it 20, any sense of urgency is completely destroyed, you know, because let's face it, I can just wait five years. You never will. But I can just put, wait five years and put in eight thousand quid. Yeah. Not going to happen. Yeah. And so the yeah, failure I'm to right, understand the bestseller. Um, you know the failure exactly. When I write this bestseller, then uh, then I'll, uh, then I'll need an ISA. <laughs> and I mean other things which are truly, truly extraordinary in behavioural terms, like the use of purely economic incentives to encourage pension saving, um, in a way that is almost as unmotivating a way to spend twenty eight billion pounds a year as you can possibly imagine. Okay, yeah. so. Effectively, um, when the government gives me £500 as a tax rebate, this should be accompanied by the sound of trumpets, okay? Instead, nothing visible happens at all. I pay money into a pension, and from some murky depths of the treasury, some additional money gets paid in, uh, to a point where I don't even notice, okay? Okay. 
So this is the economist idea of how you incentivize pension savings, which is, you could also argue there's an ethical case for it, which is otherwise people are taxed twice. A lot of countries do it differently, by the way. They simply, um, they give you tax breaks when you withdraw money from your pension yeah. rather yeah. than when you put it in. But anyway, let's park that distinction. Now here, what's extraordinary about that is I asked 200 people who work in the financial services industry a little bit of a thought experiment question. I said, if I gave you 500 pounds in cash now, and the deal was you can keep that money so long as you pay 500 pounds into your pension before you get home this evening, how many people of you, among you would know how to do that? In other words, how many of you would know how to make an ad hoc pension contribution um, uh, without actually going home first and spending about a week researching it? And one person knew how to do that, um, not typical of, I think, the British population. He worked for Goldman Sachs. Okay. Right. Now, the extraordinary thing there is you're incentivizing something which is almost impossible to do. Yeah. So um, if I worked out in order for me, now let's look at this from a behavioral science point of view, in order for me to respond to the, now if I had a windfall, let's say my book mysteriously paid some royalties for a change, and I suddenly had a few thousand pounds, which I didn't know what to do with, popping that into my pension would be a pretty sane thing to do. Nobody ever does when they have a windfall, mm. for the most part. Well, what I'd have to do is I'd have to go home ask my wife to retrieve some in incomprehensible stuff from a filing cabinet, find an address, write a check for the equivalent amount. I don't even know where my checkbook is, for God's sake, because, you know, it's not 1973. Okay, I haven't written a check for a year. Post it to some weird address in a trading estate in Bristol. And then, by the way, nothing would happen. I wouldn't get any acknowledgement of receipt. I'd have to wait six months for my next pension statement and remember to check that they'd credited that amount into my correct account now there are two things going on here first of all at a banal level no one's going to do anything which is a royal pain in the ass okay secondly by making it a royal pain in the ass you create the unconscious assumption that i shouldn't be doing it because my natural human heuristic here is if this were a normal thing for people to do they would have made it easy so the yeah. fact that it involves a bureaucratic nightmare probably means i shouldn't be doing it at all yeah how do we take these these lessons that you've gleaned? You 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 know you work with psychology graduates. You look for unseen opportunities to change consumer behaviour. That's sort of your, your your day job. Those small contextual changes that can have a big effect on the decisions people make, whether they're buying a, a Rolls Royce um, or whether they're putting money into a pension. Um, changing the copy that people use in a call centre in a way that can escalate the, the the sales rate from that call center how can we apply those lessons rory to the covid situation in terms of um getting us to behave better getting the economy to work better and and what were you thinking as a behavioral scientist if you like um as we were going into lockdown when you were hearing government ministers talking sort of pop behavioral economics we have to do it this way otherwise people will act in that way uh, one revealing thing was something i completely failed to spot by the way um which is the extraordinary public and this is something to be you know alert to the extraordinary kind of public reaction of horror at the phrase herd immunity yeah, yeah, yeah. and the reason i didn't spot it was that i was already familiar with the phrase and i knew it was the standard phrase that was used to describe this effect so it didn't strike me as egregious whereas the use of the word herd to anybody who'd never come across that phrase before yeah immediately suggests you're treating the population like cattle yeah um so actually at the very simple level of what language you use yeah, yeah, yeah. um a, a lovely example I, i've heard that nick clegg kind of wakes up sweating in the middle of the night and goes if only if only we'd called it a graduate tax not student loans the entire course of british history would have been entirely different Yep. Because if you think about it, you could have produced a product that was fundamentally identical to the loan product and basically made it a tax recovery system rather than describing the headline amount of the loan. I'm sure he soon go, go, goes back to sleep, though, Rory, because had that happened, he'd still be in politics and he wouldn't be earning squillions at Facebook, would he? That is true. Yeah, so he's probably... <laughs> your I mean, he... Compensating circumstances to... I bet with the help of his extraordinarily expensive goose-down mattress topper, <laughs> uh, he returns to sleep very promptly. Yeah, I don't know. That's, uh, that's fair. Before we go on, 
please, everybody but, listening, do do use the chat function to to pop some questions in because we will be coming to questions uh, uh, in a while. Carry on. Uh, someone's just popped up in the chat, actually. Imagine if the word had been stay rather than remain, <laughs> um, which is a very interesting question. Yeah. I did ask, by the way, just as a sideline, yeah, yeah. my suggestion for what slogan would have worked. One of the things I think about Remain, which was such a catastrophe, was that the most passionate Europeans are deeply alarming, even to people like me who are on the fence. And one of the things you learn from marketing is you have to talk. It's absolutely no use talking to your own devoted crowd of followers. Mm. You have to talk to people on the margin. Mm. And uh, my joke slogan for Remain would have been, don't leave. It's exactly what the French want us to do. Which would have would have actually captured enough percentage of the mildly jingoistic That's to right. have tipped it over the fifty percent margin. Now the truth of the matter is, the people who are um, uh, the the people who are the most passionate Europeans are the very worst people to front the campaign because they use language and terminology that seems deranged to perhaps sixty percent of the population. Yeah. I think a bigger worry in advertising is the extent to which the metropolitan worlds become detached from what you might call Main Street UK. But I'll park that for now. So the COVID crisis, first of all, what language you use really, really matters. Yeah. Um, uh, the very interesting piece in The Spectator by my friend Paul Dolan, who's a proper behavioural economist at the LSE, saying what would have happened if the first country to be infected was Sweden rather than China? Because there was a huge path dependency in the issue, which is because the Chinese, because they can, um, intervened with complete lockdown, every other country then felt obliged to adopt policies which were at yeah. least as stringent. Yeah. Whereas if Sweden, if we'd had the outbreak from some dodgy Gravidlax and the whole thing had started, you know, from a wet market in um, Malmo, okay, the entire path of, of government action might have yeah. been completely different. Yeah. Yeah. That's a thing called defensive decision making, um, uh, often written about by someone called Gerd Gigerenzer, um, which is a large part of behaviour is driven by not the not actually fear of blame becomes yeah. an absolutely massive um, problem uh, in public decision making or institutional decision making. In, sem in a sense, you'd rather make a bad decision which absolved you from blame. This happens in medicine as well, by the way. Yeah. Doctors over prescribe interventions because you can get sued for doing nothing but you can't get sued for doing something and um it's an interesting question in terms of one thing about covid i would have said is that it's not the job of behavioral scientists to decide what the behavior is that's the job of epidemiologists but then knowing what the behavior is it's our job to design how you might achieve it okay and you know, one thing I would say where we could be useful is that binary rules tend to be easier to police. They arouse more social conformity, particularly if they're visible when they're broken, than rules of degree. So generally, rules, if you want to have a high degree of conformity, it has to be visible when they're breaking, when someone's breaking them. And you have to feel that you're crossing a line. Now, in, 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 this is why calorie counting may be less effective than fasting. Uh, you feel much worse going through a red traffic light than you do breaking a speed limit, if you like. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So there's a whole element of behavioral design there. One thing I do feel strongly is that we had no choice but to intervene at an extreme level simply because we didn't know enough to do anything else. Yeah. And one thing that alarmed me, I think, and I'm straying into kind of data analysis arguments here. What people seem to be doing is they seem to be developing models around the information they happen to have to hand, rather than asking the question first, what do we need to know first? Yeah. And it struck me there are a whole load of things we didn't know about the thing. R is an average, okay? Once you have R, the only way you can intervene is to everybody. Because if you want to affect an average metric, you can't have targeted interventions because you don't know how to target them. But there are many if, R's. There are R's in care homes. R's well, this is, this is exactly it. And actually, R is probably very Pareto, okay? It's kind of 80-20. That yeah. actually... 80% or 90% of transmission probably happens in 7% of locations. Yeah. Can I tell a Pareto gag? Go for it. So Wilfredo Pareto, who's the Italian economist who uh, is often 
credited with coming up with the 80-20 rule, that in any complex system, 80% of something is accounted by 20% of something else. Okay. Um, he actually ended up his life um, in a Swiss chalet with 20 Persian cats. And my assumption is he started off with 100 cats and decided that tw the best 20 cats gave him 80% of the pleasure. But I don't know what happened to the other 80 cats. Anyway. Let's not speculate um, about that. We'll have to speculate about that one. But actually, if you'd known how, what the variance of R was, and track and trace makes that possible, um, if you'd actually inquired also a question which I don't think was ever asked, is the severity of the disease affected by the scale of the initial dose? Yeah. Which seems to me plausible, but also nearly all models assumed this was binary. You know, it wasn't a case of you could get infected badly or you could inf get infected you know, um, relatively harmlessly. It was assumed to be this binary model, which strikes me as pretty unsafe. Um, and so one of the things I would have said is, look, actually, if you want us to be really intelligent about this in behavioral science, we need to know more. Um, you know, at the very least, you need to be conducting. There were a few things like a cruise ship, which did provide a bit of control group information. Yeah. But we need to be creating groups from which we derive this information. And, you know, if we'd known earlier on that very little, don't quote me on this because it's not yet certain, but it may be the case that very little infection cross-infection takes place out of doors, for example. Well, outdoor construction work, provided that builders can, you know, resist their terrible habit of kissing on the lips every time they meet each other, um, which you know, is, is terrible, you know, builders are so known for oh, that. kind of clubs as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, you know, could have actually proceeded, but we didn't know what we needed to know. So the, now, intriguingly, for all the flack that behavioral science got, the only solutions that the entire scientific establishment could come up with were behavioral and they were stay indoors as much as possible wash your hands keep your distance okay now here i think it's interesting to note that washing hands is entirely a voluntary behavior because without implying kind of household stasi there's no way you can check on whether people are washing their hands now What's interesting is that there are a very large number of desirable behaviours, okay, which you can't drive through law and you can't drive through economics, but you can drive through persuasion. The weird thing about government is that its order of intervention is first legal, second economic, and then it barely even considers voluntary persuasion yeah. as a solution to social problems. But in many cases, actually, the only behaviours that you can really create are those which are voluntary and, in this case, kind of invisible. OK, now I'll give you a nice example of this, which, again, is a thought experiment. OK, let's say and I, I, I can't get any sense out of the energy industry at all on this. But one way in which you could reduce carbon emissions is a very, very simple thing. Don't ask people to stop doing something, ask people to do it differently, because behavioral science tells you it's always, always easier to get someone to ad adapt a behavior than to com change completely. Yeah. So one thing everybody could do, which makes a, some difference, is put your tumble dryer, your washing machine, and your dishwasher on at 10 o'clock at night rather than at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? Now... The reason for that is, you know, <coughs> broadly speaking, the UK grid is pretty damn green late at night. And so it's less likely they'll need to crank up a coal powered power station yeah. uh, if you put the dishwasher on at 11 o'clock at night. OK, so that would be a good behavior. I think, you know, let's just assume for the purpose of the exercise that that would help. OK, well, a few problems there. You could make that economic, which is you start pricing electricity very differently. OK. Um, you could make it legal, but A, it's fairly difficult to police. Let's be absolutely honest about that without a huge level of intrusion. Yeah. But there's another problem with the economic and legal interventions, which is a significant. You don't need everybody to adopt this behavior to make a difference. It's worth remembering that long before lockdown, a large proportion of the population had engaged in voluntary self-isolation. And it'd be completely wrong to think that R slogged along at four or three and then suddenly there was lockdown and it drops. Because yeah. I, I was in London on the 12th of March. It was a bloody ghost town. 
you know, there were two of us in a normally crowded coffee shop. We both washed our hands when we came in and we washed our hands when we left. I met someone, we bumped elbows, we didn't shake hands, etc. So an awful lot of the reduction of our probably happened through partial, voluntary, preemptive behavioral change. Yeah. But here's an, here are a few more problems. Let's say there will always be in the washing machine, dishwasher and tumble dryer class, a group of people who you are now unfairly penalizing. OK, so if your next door neighbor's bedroom is underneath your kitchen, they won't really thank you if your washing machine hits the spin cycle at 3 a.m. OK, yeah. if you work nights, you don't want people who work nights uh, to go out and leave their tumble dryer on because it might catch fire. OK, now, the great thing about persuasion and social pressure is if you've got a good reason not to conform, you don't have to and you aren't penalized. So all you need to opt out of persuasion is a good argument, which is, no, no, I'd like to put my washing machine on at two o'clock in the morning, but my next door neighbor would be woken up by the damn thing hitting the spin cycle. So I won't. Do you think persuasion will be a big part of as the lockdown is eased or do, mm. you, or do you think there'll be... Um, legal sanctions, fiscal sanctions, fines. Do you think we'll all end up wearing masks, if only as a kind of palliative, is only a, a way of symbolising um, our, our our care for others, um, if only to keep us uh, vigilant about social distancing? Well, the interesting question, it's funny you mentioned masks, because one of the things that interests me about masks is this business that uh, the, the use of masks is not evidence-based, okay? Yeah. Well, this it's strikes me as a confidence building measure, though, isn't it? Well, yes. A, a, and that 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 you there is a small behavioral case against masks, which is that it might make people overconfident. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, that's the one fear. It's rather like the argument that seat belts wearing a seat belt causes you to drive a little more recklessly than you did before. Right. Okay. Um, on the other hand, I was a bit alarmed by the idea that. Um, you needed absolutely rigorous evidence for the use of masks on the grounds that, um, to be honest, um, common sense would tell you that something that reduces the risk is likely to, to play some part. There's also the fact that, of course, when you're out and about, it's a reminder not to, it's a reminder of the thing because yeah. your friend is now wearing a mask. Yeah, yeah. Also, it's a little bit of an early warning that someone not wearing a mask um, is clearly not conforming to all the instructions so you might want to give them a doubly wide berth right yeah um uh so there are interesting questions about that and, and the behavioral question isn't irrelevant but i do worry about this business of the evidence base because um i would argue that um there are an awful lot of decisions we make where we don't really know the consequences we have to use something which you might call akin to common sense and um, it isn't really a question of how low the p-value is in proving masks. You simply go, what is the chance that it helps? What is the chance that it hurts? If there's a relatively low, low chance of harm and a high possibility of help, yeah. then you should probably go with it. Yeah. And it does worry me sometimes that I sometimes wonder that actually the COVID crisis is actually a good approximation to real reality, that most of the time we don't know what's going on. But we have tools like economics that allow us to pretend that we do. <laughs> you know, that, that, that actually, you know, that actually most of the time we're kind of acting blind. Yeah. But that we have these convenient intellectual frameworks which enable us to pretend we know what we're doing. John Dodds in the States has just put on the chat, um, masks over here in the US is a freedom issue, not a health issue for some. Unmasked is a badge of honour. Mm. We are going to move on to questions soon, but just before we do, Rory, you've argued in the upcoming edition of The Spectator, um, um, well, you reminded me in your article uh, when I just read it that uh, you've been advocating for a long time that people work from home more. Uh, yeah. You were inspired to that view by the economist uh, Nassim Taleb, who's the author of Black Swan, of course. Um, do you think there are going to be big changes? Do you think commercial property is going to crash? Do you think the boss class, as it were, are now more relaxed? Because people, a lot of people, a lot of professional people uh, in particular, have been working quite effectively from home and getting a lot done. Well, three months ago, four months ago, before the pandemic, I actually asked the marketing director of Zoom, again, as a theoretical exercise, what would you quote to give the entire population full Zoom access? 
Okay, so normally it's sold, you know, premium Zoom access is sold to a company. And I said, why shouldn't it be sold to a country? We spend money on roads, okay? Yeah. Why, is it, why is it perfectly acceptable to spend money on high speed too? Don't get me started. Oh. And not acceptable to spend money on other forms of connecting people. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, do you think the government's going to pivot, or, or say away from HS2 without getting into a discussion about that? Um, I mean, the behavioral full, science full, full of HS... Fiber, full fiber broadband, wouldn't that be a better way to... Well, well to you, you now have an issue, policy. which is, uh, you know, regional inequality is partly solved by this technology, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know, one of the problems Twitter, Jack Dorsey, who's now said everybody at Twitter can work from home, is he says, when I have offices in central San Francisco, I'm paying twice. I'm paying for the office space, but I'm also paying the kind of salaries that enable people to live in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, for anybody who's young, that's, you know, I, I get the, you know, at Ogilvy, when I think about it, we go and pay our younger staff, not well, but tolerably, but half of it's going straight into the pockets of some buy to let landlord. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's not, you know, uh, that's not a great thing. So th once people discover freedom of place alongside free time, that there's a value to being in a, to having freedom of place alongside free time. Yesterday, I worked in the garden in the sunlight. I got quite a lot done, but it felt like being on holiday. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and once people discover that and discover that, you know, if you only need to be in London for three days of the week, do you really want to spend the remaining four days in London anymore? When the ratio was five to two, I think the case was fairly compelling. If that ratio is three to four and reversed, different question. Yeah. Um, and I think... Um, I think at some stage, um, it, the thing that always struck me as the behavioral science equivalent of Fermat's last theorem was why we were so slow to spot the value of this technology in the first place. And I can think of about five explanations. I don't know if any of them are true. One of them I think is important, which I mentioned in the specy today, funnily enough, is that it's partly a framing problem, that when you said to staff, you're allowed to work flexibly or you're allowed to work from home, it was framed as a concession. And people felt they were burning reputational capital every time they took advantage of it, you know. Yeah. And I suddenly discovered with my own team of 15 people, it only worked, basically, um, A, if the boss did it, and John has just made exactly this point, yeah. okay? When the boss does it, somehow it's okay. Secondly, it only worked with my team. I said, no, 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 you're misunderstanding me. It's not that you can work from home. I actively want you to work yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. Not necessarily home for one or two days of the week. The reason being the Nassim Taleb point, which is that we have different kinds of work. Sometimes you want to be sociable. Sometimes you want to focus. And different settings are variously conducive to different behaviours. So if you can partition your week into sociable Tuesdays and Wednesdays and kind of introvert Fridays, it pays you to perform those functions in a different place. I, I'd also argue that the modern um, open plan office is basically a terrible halfway house. It's neither fish nor fowl. Yeah, yeah. You know, it isn't really sociable and it's not really secluded. I mean, it's a, you know, you can't get chatty because you'll disturb the saddo two, two seats along, yeah. but equally you can't sit in silence because come on, come on, disturb you. So it's a, uh, you know, universities have, you know, you have a buttery and you have a library. And those serve totally different purposes. So and you have a room. Big, will this have big economic impacts then for, you know, office buildings? Will it for, 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 for travel infrastructure? M much, much behave. A lot of behaviour will revert. We must remember that a lot of human, you know, nature is fairly uh, long established and doesn't change much. Uh, on the other hand, the working patterns question has been changed. And suddenly, if you think about it, just to John Dodds's point, I think that if the people who burned up most of the travel and entertainment expenditure of employers had been junior staff rather than the senior management, I think they would have been pressured to use video conferencing six <laughs> years ago. OK, but you didn't want to be the chief executive who said, think you're going to stay in the four seasons for three days. Forget about it. OK. So I think there was a strong element, too, which is that it became such a badge of status to have your kind of frequent flyer miles and your, um, oh, yeah. you know. And actually, of course, the weirdest thing I've discovered through this period is I lead a much more international life when I never leave the house <laughs> yeah. than I did when I was a BA Gold frequent flyer member. Because yeah, 
you know, I, I had a meeting which was someone from Perth, two people from a wildlife park in Kenya, and someone from the United States. I've had meetings with Ogilvy Tbilisi. I've had meetings with people in Peru. Now, it suddenly occurred to me, you could buy me a Learjet and I wouldn't be able to do yeah. all of that. So will, will, will the, just quickly, we're going to move on to the question, will the air travel industry ever be the same? Because if the, you're thinking that, many people are thinking that. Talking to a wonderful guy called Joe Fortune, who's the head of the... Um, America-based but international uh, airline passenger experience association. He says that most American airlines, and bear in mind that's domestic travel, which is yeah, slightly yeah. different. Yeah. They basically say for the foreseeable future, eighty percent is the only target you can aim at. Forget about getting back to a hundred. Yeah, that it essentially um, eighty percent uh, of routes restored. of previous of previous capacity. Okay. Uh, anything now, domestic travel is slightly different because. Part of the reluctance to travel is also driven by things like fear of being ill abroad and fear of not being able to get home. Yeah. Now, in the US, you can always hire a car and drive back. OK, yeah, yeah, so yeah. the fear of being stranded isn't the same as when you're on an island and the fear of being in a foreign country, you know, and getting ill isn't there either. Um, uh, the US, I guess, is a net importer of tourism. So their tourist sector will suffer quite badly. In the UK, I'd argue, if I were the Welsh or Scottish tourist board, and I was saying to you earlier, this could be a bit of a bumper year because yeah. the UK is a net exporter of tourists. Yeah. Um, and so as a result, there are going to be a hell of a lot of people suddenly going, it might be the year to discover the Lake District. Yeah. Or you had a brilliant idea, Liam, which is house swaps. Yeah, I think I think I think there'll be lots and lots of house swaps. I, I live in a sort of nice Tudor house close to Cambridge. Mm. Uh, I'd happily um, swap my house. I haven't cleared this with my partner, but um, you know, for a really nice penthouse flat in the middle of Manchester, and we can spend a week in Manchester, and they can spend a week here discovering Cambridge. I think there'll be a lot of that. Let's go to some questions from from the audience. We've got a question, I think, from. Mark Essex. Uh, Mark, do you want to ask your question and remember to unmute your mic? Yes, thank you. Uh, hi, Rory. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm very well. Very well, thank you. Very well. Um, I was wondering, does behavioural science work better if people know you're doing it? So do people <laughs> respond differently if they feel nudged? Um, in some cases, uh, you can be completely avert, by the way, and that's a very important question. And, and quite a lot of the pre-submitted questions are all about the ethical element of the thing. Now, first of all, it's worth remembering that provided you have an, you have an option to adopt the alternative, okay? And this is, so something like the opt-out pension, I think is highly significant. I also, by the way, don't think the opt-out pension is only significant because of the simple default that by default a company over a certain size will put people into a pension. I also think it's highly significant because of consumer confidence, which is we feel comfortable having a financial product that all our colleagues have in a way that by promoting choice in pensions, each pension becomes an individual decision which maximizes anxiety. To some extent, a part of the human brain is a bit like the antelope brain. We feel comfortable when we're grazing in company. To be honest, if my company opt-out pension turns a bit dodgy, I'll never notice. But some shadow in the finance department will notice and I'll get to hear about it. In the same way that if you're an antelope grazing with the herd, you don't have to spend all your time looking out for lions. You just check there aren't any panicking antelope near to you. Mm -hmm. And so you benefit from a hundred pairs of eyes rather than just one. And so that's a really important psychological factor. By the way, it's a really important psychological factor with, I think, Zoom, which is once everybody does it, it's suddenly OK. It's like driving on the left, you know, or driving on the right. You don't want to be the lone person who tries it. OK, these are behaviours which only work when they have a certain degree of penetration. And that leads me into, by the way, into a total distraction. But I'll make the point anyway. I'm sorry about being a bit tangential. I think there's a role for libertarian legislation, which is that being the first person to adopt a new desirable behavior always comes with a disproportionate amount of reputational cost. And so generally, the most important person to get a solar panel would be the first person on your street. It might be the second. I'm not sure. 
okay? Once three people on your street have solar panels, getting solar panels feels comparatively normal. Indeed, you know, soon you'll feel you're missing out. I mean, this, this by the way, is reflected in consumer behavior. You are much, much more likely to buy a pint of Guinness OK, uh, when you walk into a pub, I think the odds go up by 50, 60, 70 percent if there's someone already there visibly drinking Guinness. Mm. OK, mm. you don't you don't want to risk being the Guinness weirdo. But the second there's one person <laughs> there to provide permission, that then is. it's OK for you. OK, now I did suggest to Guinness that it would make sense, therefore, to employ people to turn up at the pub really early with their sole job being to stand there very visibly drinking the product. Because over the course of the evening, this person would actually pay for themselves. OK, uh, I don't think there'd be any shortage of applicants either. But strangely, Diageo were reluctant. They turned me down. But interestingly, um, you might argue there is scope for legislation and incentive to get desirable social behaviors out of the, the thicket of weirdness into a point where then adoption becomes natural. Okay, so at some level, and by the way, this is an important distinction. I don't see behavioral science always working in isolation from economics or legislation. I think if you look at successes like drink driving, what you see is that all three are used cleverly in conjunction. The powerful thing about drink driving now is not only the economic disincentives and the legal disincentives, it's the fact that among my children's peer group, it's considered on a par with paedophilia. You know, the, uh, the, the social stigma. I don't think any of my kids would allow a friend to get into the car if they thought they were even close to the limit. OK, now, among my parents' generation, though, just to excuse them, since my father's still alive, not my dad. Among my parents' generation, it was pretty much normalised, you know. If you're a bit boozy and lived in the country, this was sort of acceptable behavior. And you see this kind of sigmoid curve of adoption. And one thing I wouldn't mind doing is, is for government to intervene to encourage early. They're doing it with electric cars, after all. You have to essentially pump prime the system, after which market forces can probably do a capable job. But I think there is a role for what you might call um, government intervention. If we can see a desirable behavior, uh, another one would be um, pick up and collection of online deliveries. OK, I think we actually, for all sorts of reasons of sustainability and traffic, we need a nationwide open source locker system for delivery and collection. And if government intervention is necessary to get that off the ground after that stage, this is why I think government should have just bought everybody Zoom, because if you had the whole country with access to Zoom, pretty quickly ancillary businesses would have sprung up selling Zoom equipment for pensioners who didn't want the complexity of a laptop, for example. You know, you could have built a whole, in other words, you create the platform, rather like you create the rules for a sport, and then competition takes place within your, your pre-created platform. The Rory, Royal Mail was one such government-created platform, after all. Rory, let, okay. let, me, just, let me just stop you there. But, but I need to answer the, the other question about whether well, you know Oddly, in many, many cases, placebos work even if you tell people they're a placebo. Okay. <laughs> Interestingly, it's very important we know about the behavioral science of choice architecture and framing so that we can spot when it's being abused. And I will not claim for a millisecond that this cannot be put to bad use. Okay. Um, on the other hand, generally, um, you're right that the effect of this stuff is often unconscious and therefore not consciously noticed. OK, on the other hand, generally people don't change their decision subsequently if they're told what the nudge is. Richard Thaler's ethical definition is to make decisions which subsequently do not lead to regret. Rory, we've got a question from Lisa Cameron, who, as well as being a clinical psychologist, is also... Uh, the MP for East Kilbride. Are you there, Lisa? If, if... Hi, hi, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Actually, I just wanted to say it's been absolutely fascinating to listen to this as a policymaker in Parliament and to hear about some of the subconscious issues that maybe uh, we should consider that we don't, uh, or reasons that we do make decisions, such as the defensive decisions, but we don't even realise we're probably making for those reasons. So thank you very much. Um, I chair the all-party parliamentary group for psychology in the Commons, 
and I think it's certainly an issue that we would love to discuss more with you. So uh, when uh, when we get back to having our all party groups again, uh, perhaps we could link together and uh, and uh, have a further um, discussion with politicians. You can tell us why we're making the decisions that we are. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. I'm assuming you're an SNP MP. I am. Yes. Um, uh, uh, now, one suggestion. Don't talk about independence. Talk about what kind of independence you want. Reframe the debate. Oh. Because it's impossible for an English person. Now, I'm quarter Scottish, but admit, admittedly Highland Scottish. So whereas I think being called Southern's, you know, not the best thing in Scotland necessarily. We're from a different branch. I'll just make that point. Um, but um, from an Eng in English ears, when you talk about independence, it's impossible for us not to react viscerally with they hate us. Okay. If you talk about what kind of independence you want, do you want independence defence? Doesn't seem to make much sense to me. So if you start actually debating the nature rather than making it binary, mm -hmm. um, that would fundamentally change the debate. So, I mean... It, it, <laughs> George Freeman saying, no, don't tell her, don't tell her. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm, just to make a really important point about this, since I discovered, just to be you know, open about my own policies, I'm kind of very moderate right of centre Tory, but with a large, small component of kind of Marxist, anarcho-syndicalist also present in my own brain, okay? <laughs> the interesting thing about behavioural science is I wouldn't like it identified with any particular political persuasion. It's become a little bit identified with the Cameron government in the UK. In the US, it was identified with the Democrats, not with the Republicans. Because of, um, of the nudge unit and so the, on. Because of the nudge, and also, I suppose Obama also set up yeah, something yeah. Uh, uh, fairly similar. Yeah. And um, uh, the interesting thing about behavioural science is that when you start to look at the world through a behavioural lens, you become both, both a bit more right-wing and a bit more left-wing. Uh, generally... It, where it's interesting is, let's take a really good experiment, okay? I don't think that a guaranteed basic income or whatever the terminology used is, you know, where you pay everybody the same amount regardless every month, replacing a lot of welfare, and then the tax system takes care of the surplus. I'm not sure it works economically, and Liam, you'll probably have a very strong opinion on this. But it works as a thought experiment, and it's very, very interesting, because people on the right, including Richard Nixon, Milton Friedman, and my grandfather, who is, um, although he was a doctor in Tredegar, he was pretty right of centre, I think it's fair to say, all thought it was an eminently good idea, along with people on the left. Now, interestingly, it's redistributive, okay? I mean, you know, a, a, a universal basic income is highly redistributive. There would also be the risk, I think, that the Daily Mail would go practically insane because groups of people would form communes in the West Country where they all pooled their UBI and actually had quite nice lives. <laughs> um, so that, you'd, have, you'd have that problem as well, OK? Because you could actually form a kind of, you know, well, it's supposed to be a narco-syndicalist um, approach. Um, but what's interesting about it is that people on the right like it. Mm. Now, what's going on there? OK, and I think the reason is that when people say, why don't you like higher levels of taxation or wealth redistribution? They have a visceral response and then a post rationalized answer, which is not the real truth. They'll say things like, it's my money. I earned it. Why should I take it and give it to someone else? I think what they don't like about it is it doesn't preserve relative incentives and the UBI does. In other words, a sort of right wing visceral article of faith is that if one guy stays in bed all day and the other guy drives a van all day, the van driver should be richer to the extent to which he goes van driving than his next door neighbour. And the thing that often drives people, I think, insane about certain policies is nothing to do with the thing they say it is. That's just a post rationalisation or a confabulation. It's essentially an attempt to attach a rational explanation to an emotional response. And so it fascinates me that there are ways in which you can uh, completely change policy in a way that means that economically it's identical, but emotionally the response is completely different. One thing I've said for ages, by the way, is this has been a right wing advice since I'm balancing things up. Don't have tax cuts. Give people rebates. OK, a tax cut becomes completely invisible after about 12 months. But secondly, when you give a tax rebate, right, give people the option 
of giving it to the NHS. Yeah. And give people a car sticker if they donate 50%, right? Now, one, it is much, much easier for me. If you said, uh, okay, Liam, if you just said to me, I'm going to give you two grand, but I'd like you to give a grand to the NHS, okay? I'd feel a total turd if I didn't do it, okay? And on the other hand, on the other hand, if you said... Rory, can you write a check to the NHS? Okay. Yeah. Although economically the two effects are identical, emotionally the response is completely different. Right? Now, it, now, interestingly, what's also nice about that is no one's expecting a family of four with young kids to give any of their rebate to the NHS. Okay. But if you're a childless double earning couple, this is a chance to call out virtue signalers by going, it's all very well for you to complain. Shouldn't you put your money where your mouth is? Yeah. There you go, Lisa, some free policy advice. There you go. Vote independence for a universal basic income. No, no, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your question. We've got another question now from Sandra Kaduri. Sandra, are you there? Sandra's there. Uh, yes, hi, yes. My name's Sandra. I'm in uh, Regent's Park at the moment. Um, my question to Rory is, uh, how do governments get people to vote against their own interests and in defiance of logic and reason? Mm -hmm. um, the, th this is a wonderful question. I, I mean, there are some <laughs> books which suggest that actually people's economic interest is quite well expressed by voting patterns, but I think you might argue uh, that uh, there's a large tribal component to it. Okay. And there is a fairly big um, tribal component to uh, behavior. And I think... Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm quite friendly with Jonathan Haidt, who's probably the great guru in this, that we have kind of moral and ethical taste buds. And Haidt's claim, which, by the way, he didn't expect, he started as a kind of left of centre academic investigating the psychology of political allegiance and political belief. And... He started off, he admits this freely himself, basically going, look, the problem with the American right is they're a bit thick. OK. And, um, you know, I think that was his kind of, you know, starting point. And one of the things he discovered, which, which I think is probably valid, is that oddly, the right understand the left much better than the left understand the right. Um, so that there are certain um, aspects of right wing. Um, he's essentially believes that human ethics arrive through as a solution to evolutionary problems that we we've essentially evolved an ethical sense about things and his argument is that contrary to what people on the left on the left think people on the right are concerned very heavily with fairness and they're concerned with proportionality certainly um the idea that they're entirely kind of self-interested financially is a misrepresentation i think by the left of most right-wing people's views of um uh, of political debate and so what tends to happen is the left misrepresent the right and the right fi find the left doing things a classic example of how to drive right-wing people crazy is flag burning okay because to a left-wing person it's just you know it's a bit of a cheap virtue signaling showing your discomfort with the uh, behavior of homeland security okay to the right, that's an act of dis desecration. Um, because the right have certain kind of ethical um, uh, uh, beliefs or sensitivities, which the left doesn't fully understand. And I think one thing that's caused a problem is that people signaling to people on the left signaling to other people on the left will rapidly develop behaviors which are so um, unattractive to people to the right that you just go to be honest i don't care who i'm voting for but i'm not voting for these people it, 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 i mean you know, acts of conspicuous i mean acts of conspicuous unpatriotism are basically a death knell if you want to appeal to uh, you know people whose identity resides in where they live and 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 some some element of national identity um, yes. the, the other really helpful work is that somewheres anywheres distinction, which I think is uh, Philip Goodhart, isn't it? David, David Goodhart. David, David Goodhart. Sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, so you've got you've got two generations of one family. Goodhart's law, which is any metric that becomes a target, loses its value as a metric, which is a brilliantly valuable the concept. Charles Goodhart. Ch that was Charles, was it? Yeah. yeah. And then um, and then uh, uh, David himself with the somewheres and anywheres. Yeah. 
It's worth remembering that metropolitan young people whose status derives from what they do and what education they had, okay, dominate certain areas of, of decision making, not least the media and advertising to a great extent. Um, in overall population terms, they're highly anomalous. Yeah. Interesting. And it's worth remembering, by the way, if you belong to that tribe, you belong to an international tribe. Okay. So your the idea that you're threatened by internationalism seems completely bizarre because I talk to the people in Ogilvy, Tbilisi, and they seem basically pretty much like me. Okay, with accents. But the if you belong with, to a, um, the problem with resorting to tribalism, though, is it really tends to polarise, and coming back to common values is very difficult after that. Um, I don't. I think it's. I think it's inescapable that humans have evolved to organise themselves. And the only way I can describe it is um, polycentric. So you can be loyal to an area and to a wider area and to something bigger. Um, but I, I, I think that there's a natural tendency um, of humans to essentially have concentric circles of loyalty. In other words, or to put it very bluntly, I don't think utilitarianism plays with evolutionary psychology very well. I think most people feel you have a deeper obligation to people who are near you or in your group than you do to comparative strangers. And um, you can see all sorts of evolutionary reasons for that, not least the chance of reciprocation, of course. Um, and it's very interesting how the second this, the, suddenly the second coronavirus rears its head, national borders suddenly are the area in which people lock things down. Rory, you're showing no sign of flagging uh, characteristically. Fabulous discussion. Tons of messages on the chat. We're going to just take another couple of questions, uh, if we may. Thanks so much for, for, for a, a brilliantly fascinating uh, uh, evening. I, I, I agree with you about David Goodhart's book. I used to work with him at the FT. It's a fabulous um, analytical framework. I wonder if, 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 if more people are uh, able to work in their hometowns, if, we, if, if the country becomes less London-centric, I'm leaping ahead here, maybe the somewhere, anywhere distinction that David refers to um, will break down a little bit. Maybe... You, you know, you don't have to go to London to be a success, as many people from around the country feel. Well, maybe, maybe that may start to change. Well, well, let's look at this from a path dependency point of view, which comes back to my idea of student debt, which is sunk cost bias is a very strong force. By the way, that will be why it's very difficult to break lockdown. I didn't agree, although I think they did highly commendable work and don't deserve much flack. I didn't agree with the concept of behavioral fatigue. I don't think there's any evidence okay. for that. Yeah. Everything we know about behavior suggests that actually, you know, prisoners become highly institutionalized and habituated to their surroundings uh you know even in conditions of extraordinary kind of oppression yeah, yeah. and the sunk cost bias is well having spent six weeks keeping myself in isolation i'm going to feel a bit of an idiot if i just wander out to meet a friend and end up catching it yeah, so yeah. we probably have created in some percentage of the population a kind of agoraphobia it's common, by the way, in the long-term unemployed, which is something you've got to watch. Yeah. Uh, that's a, 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 and by the way, uh, if you want a, a very, very simple generalization uh, with behavioral science and psychology, um, one, uh, it expands the solution set, if nothing else. Even if it's not a perfect science, it enables you to ask broader questions. Two, to that argument that we spend too much on, sorry, too little on mental health relative to physical health, I'm entirely on board with that argument, yeah. by the way. Let's take a question from uh, Tony Hockley from uh, the LSE. Tony, if you're there, remember to unmute yep. your mic. Nice to see you. Hi. Good evening. Wow. Hi. Thanks. Book bookshelf uh, winner of the evening, definitely. Yeah, oh, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. You're, you're under you're underplaying that your your incredible bookishness. I've never heard some, somebody quote so many references in speech, <laughs> and yet we you 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 you. you, you low key on the books in 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 the sutherland study sorry tony go no, they're too uh, disordered yeah i shan't tell you how much effort's you gone just into rearranging the competition bookshop. knowing what you're reading <laughs> <laughs> sorry tony um yeah i, I was going to ask saying that some people saying there's because we've faced a global and very invisible risk and uh, everyone's now experienced that is there a potential to carry this over into climate change policy will we is there an opportunity for, for action that wasn't there before because of... Yeah. Um, one thing I think, I, I mean, um, funnily enough, one interesting aspect of climate change is 
something which the advertising industry did without knowing it okay in the advertising industry you know it can't lay claim to many massive pro-social achievements but it has spent a hundred years persuading everybody to buy soap um which i think it's fair to say before penicillin um raising standards and expectations of hygiene probably contributed more to lifespan uh, than most medical discoveries you know it combined with things like sewerage and so forth and one of the interesting aspects of soap is you if you look at the, the soap advertising of the 1920s it's actually selling a social good on a selfish benefit okay and it doesn't say wash with pear soap and help prevent a cholera outbreak okay uh, what the ad actually says uh, it's very very darwinian is basically if you don't wash with our soap you'll die single and, al and alone <laughs> okay <laughs> and there, there are ads which make explicit references to, i mean the, the phrase always a bridesmaid never a bride comes from an american listerine advertisement basically worrying people about bad breath wow. and i think um, what's interesting about that is you can achieve behavioral change by what I call scenting the soap. In other words, provide a selfish benefit along with the pro-social benefit. And I think very extreme virtue signalers want to make it all about self-denial. Okay. Now the problem with this, and this would be counter signaling, if you like. Okay. Is that counter signaling doesn't scale beyond a certain point of the population. Okay. So, counter signaling is where you deliberately adopt a low status behavior as a way of demonstrating your status because no one without your status I mean, could afford to do this so if you're the chief executive or indeed the prime minister and you cycle to work it's patently a choice not a compromise and you gain status through doing it whereas if you work at pizza hut and you cycle to work it means you can't afford a car okay so the same thing doesn't actually scale down the population and so one of the dangers I have with that kind of self-denial form of signaling is it confines the behavior in a far narrower area of the populace, almost by necessity than otherwise. So one, I suppose, um, uh, you know, if you look at electric cars, to be honest, what percentage of people buying them are really buying them to save polar bears that's the official explanation but 3.7 seconds not to not to 60 for the tesla model 3 is pretty damn appealing um and it's pretty damn interesting and there's a whole aesthetic reason as well and i wonder you know what one of the things we have had over the last six weeks is we have had an intimation of a slightly slower cleaner quieter world and we don't altogether dislike what we've seen do we no, absolutely. So there is that question which I've always wondered of what's the balance in environmental behavior between um, what you might call selfish benefits. Look, this is simply a nicer way to live. Okay. In all manner of respects, this is a pleasanter and more civilized way to live um, than um, uh, versus the claim to altruism and self denial. So if you take vegetarianism, I'm very interested by the American brands like Beyond Meat because health food and vegetarian food always used to adopt the language of kind of um uh, you know uh, again self-denial or hair shirtedness and beyond meat does something completely different it says this stuff is meatier than meat itself and that that interests me which is that you can you can broaden the appeal of something the other thing is i've always argued that no one's provided choice architecture um, a good choice architecture for enabling people to adopt more behaviorally, um, a more environmentally sensitive behavior through, through some manner of choice. So, so something that's always interested me is a pledge you can sign where you effectively say, um, okay, there are nine big behaviors on the left and nine small behaviors on the right. And for the first three years, we want you to adopt any three from the left and any three from the right. Because the, it's rather like healthcare. One of the problems which happens with healthcare is that if you give advice which is good on average, okay, avoid salt. Okay, that's a piece of healthcare advice. If you look at it actually in the field of personalized medicine, about 93% of people are completely unaffected by their salt consumption. It doesn't affect their blood pressure at all. The reason that avoid salt is good advice is not because it's good advice for everybody. It's that the average life expectancy will improve because of the spectacular gains made by the 7%, okay? Mm. 
But the problem is, is that when you give advice that's good for some people to everybody, we get so overburdened with things we're supposed to do that life, if we obey every single health prescription without targeting it to our particular condition, becomes kind of unlivable and ridiculously complicated. And so one thing I've mulled over with people in the environmental movement is if you say, you know, I asked a bunch of people who are kind of very frequent flyers. I said, if you could pledge not to fly for eight months of the year, so you could just basically demand, I'm terribly sorry, it's June, so it'll have to be a video conference. How would you react? And all but one of them said, well, actually, secretly, I'd be delighted because yeah. I get sick of this business. Don't get me wrong. Flying is fairly fun. I like traveling, but it becomes utterly tedious. Okay. So giving people an option to start adopting behaviours where at the lowest cost to themselves or even at a benefit to themselves before then gradually expanding it rather than hitting people with a barrage of you have to change your entire life from top to bottom uh, at one moment in time, which is an impossible behavioural ask. It does strike me that often, I think often in movements, the most extreme adherence of the movement provide an unrealistic uh, example to everybody else. Um, let's go to another, let's go to another question, um, Rory, some fascinating stuff, stuff there. I, I certainly think that um, we'll be flying a lot less um, and uh, your idea of, um, having specific months where people pledge not to fly. But there's, there's an interesting question, isn't it? Why government... Let's just go to, let's just go to a question from... from of course, Rio. sorry, sorry. Rio's been very, um, very patient. Rio, are you there? And please unmute your mic. Hello. Hello. Hello there. Hi, Rory. How are you? Very well. Very well. Good to hear Good. from you. Thank you. Um, I used to work at Kantar, so I've seen you speak many times um, and uh, I can never repeat your stories to other people. Um, <laughs> so my question is um, just a really basic one. What's the number one book that you would recommend um, about behavioural science? And I'm talking fascinating, interesting. Uh, what's the one to start with? An interesting one. Um, there are many, many, and no one covers the waterfront. Um, obviously, I'd recommend my own, but um, <laughs> uh, that would be, that'd be uh, alchemy. That would be a ridiculously self-serving thing to do. Um, but a British colleague of mine, The Choice Factory by Richard Shotton, if you want to apply these learnings, there's a difference between the theoretical learnings and the application. And probably The Choice Factory by Richard Shotton would be a very good place to start. Another one would be Predictably Irrational by... Um, uh, Dan Ariely, or indeed Nudge by Thaler and Sunstein. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there are there, there are quite a few. There's, um, yeah. It's worth saying, and um, not one of them covers the waterfront. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. I've got a long list to keep me busy in lockdown. <laughs> mm. Let's move on to Meg. Meg White Thompson if, is Meg there? Please, please remember to unmute. Hi. Hi, Meg. Yeah. Hi. Um, patient. That's all right. I'm just coming back, really, back to the coronavirus business that we're sure. all in. Um, how could policy advocating action based on, quotes, good British common sense be communicated in a way that takes into account the fact that common sense varies between individuals, <laughs> dependent yeah. on individual circumstances? So, for example, what seemed common sense pre-lockdown may not seem common sense to everyone now when their economic and social circumstances are so different? Um, no, I mean, there are certain things where if you think about it, um, a degree of... In <laughs> there used to be a comedian, I think, I, I can't remember which one it was, it was someone like Max Miller in the 1930s, who used to go to football matches and shout at the players, use your own judgment for the touchlines. And... There is an element where, in releasing lockdown, an element of individual judgment probably becomes fairly necessary, because one of the things we've said as an organisation is we can't repopulate our office fully, even if we wanted to. Secondly, um, since we can work from home perfectly well in what's essentially, a, you know, uh, the, the kind of business we're in, uh, or most of us can, we are in a sense doing the best thing by leaving the public space to people who absolutely need it. 
On the other hand, we acknowledge the fact that there are individual circumstances in both extremes. There may be people who are in a nightmare flat share, okay, or indeed a nightmare relationship, which they got into shortly. And I, I always think that must be the biggest dilemma. You just started a romantic relationship a week before lockdown. What the hell do you do? You know, um, uh, you know that there are individual circumstances where we have to provide a place for people to go. Um, there are also people who are, for example, carers or living with the immunocompromised. Now, you can't demand of those people that they they reveal their particular state and you have to allow their own judgment. It would be un unreasonable for an employer to intrude to that extent on people's uh, individual circumstances, I think. OK, and so um, I, oh, a large part of this, in some ways, is a case where... Um, to individual discretion if it if it takes britain to sweden okay um is probably the best way of doing it in other words use your individual judgment now there are problems patently in that you're right that there are some people uh, not these people locally in my nearby town who seem to be ignoring any kind of concept of distancing altogether despite the fact that it's a sunny day and that is that is fairly alarming because uh, the risk of you know future outbreaks um uh, is ever you know is patently ever present um i think uh, i think it is it is an interesting question because social pressure could break down and, and the, you know in the very early days social pressure was fairly intense yeah. and there was fairly strong shaming it's worth remembering that much as we hate our tabloid press one thing it can do is by its expertise in generally you know depositing shame on people uh, it can have its own power in in driving you know degrees of conformity in this kind of thing um but um the the fear that you divide into two where you have basically a, a hyper paranoid population and a population who don't seem to care does seem to be a real problem which we need to get, actually give some thought to um let's move let's move on to uh, uh, I think this will be it has to be our final question we're already 25 i don't mind yep um it's yeah it's not like anyone's got anywhere they need to be right <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> um we've got a question from michael holland are you there michael yes Thank yes you. um no i was just going to ask um whether you could give us some you know macro major examples of where behavioral economics if it had been used properly would have resulted in the past in better policies um i can't uh, obviously in cases where what you might call the, uh, the the control group doesn't exist it's difficult uh, i think we can i think we can look at the opt-out pension as a highly significant uh, effect i think the change in blood donation uh, rule or, or, or organ donation rules to make it managed choice rather than opt-in will be similarly huge cass sunstein uh, who i was emailing with the other day said you know if there's one finding from behavioral science defaults really matter yeah uh you know what the default behavior is uh, essentially has a huge bearing on what people do um and um uh, i think we can also look at, at, at you know really well i, th I think i think there are macro questions to be asked around the fear of inflation for example you see i'm not i i, I, now, I genuinely don't know the answer to this and this is a, actually me asking a question to liam really um which is a lot of economics was basically formulated for the 18th century in conditions of extraordinary scarcity where if you didn't have enough corn you needed more potatoes and if you didn't have enough potatoes you needed more corn okay if you have an advanced economy where there is a huge amount among the richest the richer 50 percent okay there's a huge amount of discretionary and substitutable activity isn't there really mm. in the sense that you know a lot of economic behavior whether this is good or bad is an interesting question okay but a lot of it is you buy things to give yourself a kind of endorphin rush i mean you know is the fashion industry no different from the tea coffee and tobacco industry in being essentially selling a mind-altering mind substance okay 
So you get a hit from the purchase of new clothes and the value of new clothes is no longer that they protect you from the elements. I know, I, I think we can probably say everybody on this call, the last pair of shoes you bought wasn't because your last remaining pair had developed a hole or because you needed to protect your feet from the cold. It was done for some other reason. And I often wonder about this, which is um, uh, why, uh, why we're so paranoid about inflation when in many cases you can simply substitute one endorphin rush for another. Uh, it isn't like calorific provision. Another one which is a massive one, if you want a macro example, is the disgraceful and abominable fact that for 25 years, okay, house price rises were presented as a good news story. So weirdly, we got absolutely paranoid about inflation because Kendall mint cake had gone up by 7%. Okay. And yet the fact that something which is absolutely essential to, uh, you know, anybody's livelihood in many cases, which is a place to live, the fact that you had what was in a sense use value being conflated with investment value. Now, nobody says great news for those of you with a full tank of petrol. Petrol prices are going up. OK, weirdly, with property prices, the entire framing of the language was, hey, isn't this great? By a lot of middle aged people in the media who already owned a five bedroom bloody house in Clapham. OK, now here's an interesting one. If you look at the world uh, non ergodically, OK, there is only one per one group of people for whom rising house prices are actually good news for most of your life you want to move from a smaller house to a bigger house or your wife does or your husband does okay now as a result you don't want prices to go up because the gap between your present accommodation and better accommodation is widening whenever house prices rise the only time that large house price gains are an advantage is if you're planning to downsize at the end of your life one or if you're a young person who's waiting for your parents to die okay be very, very dark about it all right now, what's extraordinary to me is that for 30 years, this wasn't viewed as a problem. And so you had a group of people who were absolutely paranoid about the inflation rate, despite the fact that you can now buy a flat screen TV, 4K, 55 inch TV for a tiny fraction of what it cost years ago. You know, most meaningful, important things are actually pretty cheap. OK. Um, a large proportion of things which are expensive are probably Veblen goods of some kind. I, you know, I would argue. And Robert the Frank argues where the prices signal status. The, the price signal status, and actually yeah. they're popular because they're expensive. Yeah. You know, um, huge changes. My joke about my being fifty-four is that when I was a kid, everybody wanted to buy really cheap bread so they could afford an expensive television, and now everybody wants to buy a cheap television so they can ex afford expensive bread. You know, um, that status signaling, you know, just takes its own form and its own shape. And the, so as a macro thing, the fact that no one treated rising house prices with alarm until it was grotesquely too late. Strikes me as one of the most extraordinary mistakes we made. Rory, do you want to do you want to we've still got loads of questions coming in, but we are going to have to bring this to, to, to a close. Have you got any final thoughts that you'd like to share well, with, with our audience? Well, on particularly related to COVID, related to where we are, um, where we'll be as a society in, in uh, let's, time? Let's, have, let's end with a bit of a laugh by having a dig at high speed two, okay? Um, which is one, uh, it is no longer safe to assume that whether speed or capacity was the driving force behind this thing, that that is in any way a relevant projection anymore. Well, Funnily for enough, inter for international listeners, sorry, Rory, because uh, this is a high speed rail link connecting London and Manchester at a cost of somewhere between 60 billion and X, where X is an inordinately large number it goes from london to birmingham and then on to manchester and leeds uh and by the time it gets to manchester and leeds we're looking at the mid 2030s at the earliest mm. carry on carry on rory and so um uh it, that's a case where i think if you look at transport metrics which is an obsession of mine yeah. they're entirely driven by utterly bizarre assumptions so um the justification for any investment in transport uh, in the UK is 
almost entirely predicated on time savings. As I've been arguing for ages, it, as any business person will tell you, we look forward to a two hour train journey because it's in fact, it's the most productive point of our whole week. Um, there are a whole bunch of things to do with railway metrics, which have never had, and the reason I use this as a representative example is railway culture is driven by engineers and it's driven by kind of SI units of speed and distance and punctuality. It's not driven by consumer focused psychological metrics at all. Okay, and I repeatedly keep pointing out that there are loads and loads of ways you can solve problems uh, psychologically and redirect um, uh, expenditure once you actually look at what people actually care about rather than what engineers think is important. So just to give a very simple example, okay, um, high speed one's quite a good idea. And the reason high speed one's quite a good idea is because a distinction the model doesn't capture is that there's a huge difference between saving, um, uh, let's say, uh, 100 people uh, 400 hours a year on their commute from Ashford versus what High Speed 2 does, which is it saves the same amount of time, but it's saving actually 50,000 people four hours twice a year. OK, now, so high, sorry, Rory, high speed one is an existing line is an existing so line, which serves London, the Kent coast, the okay. Kent coast as part of the London to Paris Euro tunnel mm. link. And there's an intermediate station in Kent that's called Ashford. Sorry, Rory, carry on. Now, the argument I make is that a, a, a something which saves a lot of people a reasonable amount of time infrequently is not the same as something that saves a smaller number of people. Uh, the same amount of time very frequently in terms of its effect on human behavior. I would argue that in any case that if you look at humanity and look at high speed two, just to give a simple example, Lyon to Paris, which used to be four hours and is now two with a TGV, that is a game changing speed increase because it now means you can travel between Lyon and Paris for the day without having to stay overnight. Reducing the Manchester to London time from two hours to one is not a corresponding change because to any business person, a trip to Manchester before and after the high speed two will involve a unit of time, which is known as a day out of the office. And that fundamentally doesn't change. OK, I've never woken up in the morning as a business person. and thought I would go to Manchester today, but it takes an hour too long. OK, decisions simply don't operate at that kind of scale. And yet you have utterly insane things where an interesting attempt to run the track alongside the M40 OK, which I think was proposed by Ove Arup. Now, the clever thing about that is if you already live by the M40, London's you're not that bothered. That's a London. Yeah. London, 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 London. Yeah. Now, the clever thing about that is if you already ne live next to the M40, you're not that bothered by noise by definition because you've chosen to live next to a motorway. OK, so you can hardly complain when a train is added on top. That was rejected because the model suggested that, OK, um, the model effectively suggested that every half minute of time saving was worth a billion pounds. And because this route took something like nine minutes longer, it was rejected. Now, in terms of human behavior and human perception, that nine minutes is totally irrelevant to anybody's propensity to take that journey. And the model was assuming something was linear, which patently was not. OK, now. The extraordinary thing about that is that um, uh, it terrifies me when I look at the number of models, which are an attempt to create unambiguous decision making for people who are frightened of blame by essentially freezing the ambiguity of human psychology and perception out of consideration in order to try and replicate Newtonian physics and come up with a single right answer. OK, and I, it suddenly occurs to me that in our need to make decisions which we can defend, we f shy away from using psychology, which is a fuzzier area completely. And so we pretend that the decision is entirely about objective SI unit metrics. And as a result, we make a very bad decision, which is easy to defend, which you might argue is politics in a nutshell. <laughs> that. that that it's a series of very, very bad decisions that are taken because it's it's easy for a civil servant to provide justification, which won't then lead him into any blame. The second you admit your decision is a bit subjective, uh, your neck's on the line. 
You know, Rory, I'm just just noticed in my study, I looked up and I saw a poster from Kilconomics, the, the festival that we regularly attend and, and uh, appear on panels at. And it's got a quote from you, Rory Sutherland. Here we go. You want to hear it? People don't, people don't do what they say they believe. They do what's convenient and then they repent. That's actually from Bob Dylan, would you believe it? From Brownsville Girl for the Dylanologists among you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so any, any Dylan fans? Dylan is actually, I think, rather like Shakespeare, is a rather good behavioural uh, scientist uh, avant la lettre, as it were. Rory Sutherland, what can, what can I say? I mean, with you, I mean this in the nicest possible way, conversation is always a contact sport, just a, a, a torrent, a tsunami of ideas, of references, of connections, of fascinations, of, you know, you apologise for going on a tangent. It's the tangents that I really, really enjoy. The, our chat um, feature here is absolutely splattered with, with praise for you really really good event this was so interesting i've just bought the book i've bought two books since i started listening to this you've been extremely generous with your time rory we really do appreciate it i'd like to thank uh, no, no. Uh, uh, oh, i mean the great thing about this is it is a game everybody can play once you have permission to expand the solution space into psychological solutions I'll end with a little quote. The single best thing the London Underground did to improve passenger satisfaction wasn't faster, more frequent, later running trains. This is per pound spent. It was dot matrix displays on the platform. Okay. Yeah. In other words, we're happier waiting nine minutes for a train if we know it's coming in nine minutes than waiting five minutes in a state of uncertainty. Yeah. And so quite often informational solutions are a brilliant substitute for engineering solutions. Uber, the map. For example, there's another case in that. You can see your car approaching, so you no longer worry about it. Okay. And I think what's vital is that nobody, if you give the task first to lawyers or economists or engineers, they will, it's to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you can just expand the solution space into psychology, then the possibilities are immense. Informational solutions are often better than engineering solutions, said like a, a true communications Mm. Guru. Here's something else. You Smart said. motorways. That's another one. Okay. If you're spending, okay, government, right. If you're going to spend a hundred million on smart motorways or per whatever it is, so many miles, you're spending a few billion on smart motorways. This is a bit of self-interest. Spend six million quid, which is 400 yards of smoke motorway on an advertising or public information campaign, telling people how to use them. Right. The point is that, there's a totally um, counterintuitive thing about a smart motorway, which is that the, the more you drive slower in response to the speed recommendation, the faster you'll get there because it keeps traffic density even so that nobody grinds to a halt. Now, that's a very counterintuitive thing for people to get their heads around. It's a bit like the idea that everybody standing on their own step on the, uh, on the underground escalator is more efficient than people on the left walking. And that's because people on the left walking have to leave two steps between each other to stop bumping into each other. OK, it's a counterintuitive thing. You have to teach people that there's a psychological component to solving the problem as well as an engineering component. Rory, we're, we're all completely exhausted. And, and Sorry. You know, I, I know from having spent evenings on a bar stool with you, you're only in second gear. <laughs> 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 you once said that advertising uh, in its toleration for eccentricity and diversity is a very interesting place to work. You've shown all of us on that this call all of those qualities tonight. You've shown diversity of thought, of reference, of knowledge. You've shown eccentricity. Uh, you've shown a tremendous amount of talent, and we've all had a very, very interesting time. Thanks to you, Rory Sutherland, from all. That's of a huge pleasure. Any time. All of us and, um, and from everyone the, the Ten, you get you getting a little clapet there from um, George Freeman. Uh, so these events are so important. In the post, Rory. There you go. Yeah. Okay. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for all your questions, your fabulous comments. I'm sorry uh, that I haven't managed to read all of them. I'm going to go back and do that now. Uh, thank you, George, for creating the Big Tent. Thanks to yeah, thank you. and her team. Um, if you want to see a replay of this, if you want to show your friends a replay uh, or any of the Big Tent digital sessions, that's one of the exclusive benefits available to Big Tent friends and to student friends.
So visit the Big Tent website or follow the link in any Big Tent email. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. This has been my pleasure. Good night. Mind you, thank you very much. Dear Ori. Pleasure.